guys, welcome back to Home Built. And this week, I'm going to start having a look at the engine on my 240Z. This is the uh, the engine I got with. Uh, my 240Z. I have no idea about its uh, condition. I do know that this is not the uh, matching number engine for the car because this is actually an L28. For those who don't uh, understand Datsun nomenclature, basically the uh, the Datsun 240Z came out with a L24, which is a 2.4 litre L series straight six engine, and then they gradually went larger to 2.6 and then to a 2.8. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pull the spark plugs and I'm going to drop a bit of oil in each of the cylinders just so that um, I ensure that everything's lubricated. I'll leave it for a little while, just let it sort of settle in there and um, I have no idea how long since this car's, this engine's even been turned over. So um, first things first, let's pull some spark plugs. Okay, I pulled all those plugs and I put uh, just a thimble full of oil down uh, down each uh, spark plug hole. Now I'm going to try and uh, just see if it turns over. I don't even know if this thing's seized or, or what. So um, I've got my uh, breaker bar and my 27mm uh, socket, which fits nicely on the end of this. So um, let's give it a go. All right, when I'm turning it, I can hear the air moving around in there. So now I'm going to connect up my compression tester and because I don't have a starter motor connected to it, I'm going to crank it by hand and see how that goes. It's probably not going to be accurate, but I'm sort of, instead of finding the total compression, I'm more looking at uh, if there is a particular cylinder that's low. All right, that is very mysterious. I'm getting zero on the compression gauge, which doesn't seem right and there's not a lot of pressure on here but surely I should be getting something so uh, I've got to check the gauge and just see it might be the gauge that's not working all right so we have a, uh, a bit bit of a mystery here because this is reading zero compression on all cylinders now that sounds odd to me that it should that it's reading absolutely nothing and it is quite you know it turns over it's not that hard to turn there's a little bit there but not not enough i've done a little bit of research i'm not sure on any suggestions i'm open to um the likelihood of the head warp that far that all cylinders are zero or uh, just blown head gasket or something i can understand you know a few of them, but because all of them are reading absolutely nothing on the compression gauge, I'm suspecting it could possibly be the uh, the timing chain has jumped or something. So the timing is so far out that the valves are opening and, and letting the compression out. I think the next step is to uh, take the rocker cover off at least and, uh, and have a bit more of a look. Starting at this end of the engine, it um, doesn't look terrible. There's not crazy amounts of wear on this cam gear here, looking uh, not too bad. But working my way along, this end, there's a little bit of corrosion around here, but uh, nothing crazy. But we get down this end, and look at that. I mean, that they're on the on the off side of the cam, so it's actually, you know, they're 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 not touching. I still don't like the look of that much corrosion on. Uh, on the cam loads, even if they're on the back of the cam loads. So and now my next task is to uh, see if I can work out where the uh, the timing is set and see if the timing is All out. Right. The plot thickens. I've just done a little bit more research and um, I'm not sure if you can see right here. If you see that number one written right here on the cam sprocket, there's one, two and three. So basically from what I have uh, read up, as the chain gets older, there's a little bit more slack and uh, basically it advances the timing by the slack. And um, to retard the timing again, you can move it to position two and that will give you a bit more life and then move it to position three. Once it's at position three, it's, it's all over. So um, I can see that it's actually currently, you can actually see that marking on the, uh, on the chain there and it's lined up here. Somebody scratched into the, um, 
the sprocket so it is set up on number one so there is and there is still plenty of tension they said to check the uh, the back side of the chain and you know it's not it's not really loose it's it's still quite you know reasonably tight there's a divot in the back of the uh, the housing there and there's actually like a, a notch that has to line up well basically the notch is all lined up the engine is at top dead center I can see that by uh, I pulled the spark plug out I can uh, and I turned it and you can actually see the top of the piston there I could visually see that uh, so timing doesn't look like it's out um, and as you can see that's also top dead center on the first piston and you can see the cam lobes are not uh, not touching the rockers so the uh, the valves are fully closed at top dead center and that's sort of the roughly the position I think they're supposed to be in so um, the plot thickens why am I not getting any compression well this engine has got me stumped for now so I'm going to set it aside and get back stuck into uh, some panel work on this bonnet so as I showed you before, the bonnet at the back here has this really nasty looking repair on it. I'm imagining this bonnet probably was taken off of a car and left standing up uh, against a wall or something for uh, some time and water is collected down in between the panels at the back here and rusted out this back section. I'm going to make up a new section, I'm going to cut this all out and re-weld in a whole new section and uh, hope I can get it a little bit better than what it is now. Take you through my uh, my patch repair process. At least this is the way I've been doing it. I've roughly worked out my patch area size, and then I cut out a cardboard template of that size. Then I use this cardboard template to cut out a piece of steel out of my steel sheet, and then I made up my patch panel. And I've gone on and I've and I've gone through and uh, sat it on top and tried to bend it in the same shape as the existing panel so that it all matches in nicely, in theory. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Now I've marked out all the way around my panel, so now all I need to do is cut it out and then uh, weld it in, I hope. This piece I've now cut out of here and uh, yeah, there's quite a bit of rust on this uh, panel inside here. So uh, right now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through and I'm going to um, wire wheel the whole thing back and, uh, and uh, see if I can do something about some of this uh, rust before I cover it back up again. All right, so you saw me there, I've gone through and I've uh, used a rust converter and everything. I've left it for sort of uh, about half an hour, which, uh, which converts it all and stops the rust continuing. And now I'm gonna go over with a, um, a, a weld through gale primer and prime all this area underneath and all the inside of these panels. So then I can go through and uh, weld everything on. I'm gonna to have to go through around all of the edges of this bonnet because there is obviously more rust in underneath these areas. I can't justify stripping the whole thing back just to sort of get um, some surface rusts under here. I think if I can stop it from the inside, I'm going to do like a spray in, uh, maybe a fish oil type thing or something like that to stop it from continuing to rust inside these panels. All right, so you can see I've cut this panel out and it's a nice tight gap all the way around. So now I'll get out the, uh, the welder and start just tacking it in and uh, see how we go. That's the uh, very, very ugly welding I've done on here. Uh, it's not very pretty and there's like, uh, it's warped the panel quite a bit like I expected. It might be ugly, but uh, once I grind it all back, at least then I can start um, getting the panel as straight as I can. All right, 
so I've uh, ground back all my welds and um, most of it is pretty reasonable. This sits, there's a bit of a low strip just here that's sitting low uh, and just right here is sitting a little bit low and I'll just, uh, I'll see what I can do about panel beating that and getting it uh, a lot neater. So a bit of panel beating, and um, I've actually got this um, back to uh, quite a good uh, level spot. There's a little bit low here where I just, uh, the uh, the panels didn't weld up perfectly straight, and I welded it a little bit low, so there's like a oh, half a millimetre. But again, that's just gonna require the tiniest skim of filler, and it'll be good. As you saw, I used my uh, stud puller uh, contraption to pull this uh, dent out the corner here. That's, that's much better now. Um, the only thing I've got left, which is an issue, which was actually not caused by my welding, it was actually already there, is this here. You can see that. That's the tin can effect as they, uh, sorry, the oil can effect as they call it. That, I think, is because of the previous panel beating. It's been stretched, the metal's been stretched. So um, I'm gonna try another method now, which is basically to, to get rid of that effect, is I need to shrink the metal back. Basically, the metal's too big, so it's either, it keeps popping either way. I've got to shrink it. I'm going to try the blowtorch heat method. I've never done it before, but um, there's always a first time for everything, so let's give it a go. <laughs> wow, that worked. That worked great. Um, that, this is, there's no, there's no more tin can popping, uh, oil can popping, there's no more oil can popping around here, it's all, um, you know, it's all nice, nice and firm now, and, uh, and I've managed to get it, you know, quite flat and neat and got most of these, uh, dents out and it looks really good. Basically what the principle is, um, I believe, what I was doing, and obviously it works, where, where it was popping, where it was, where it was clicking in, I'd sort of find the centre of the um, the stretched area and I'd heat it up uh, until it just started going sort of uh, red and what as, as soon as I start heating it up the whole thing I'm not sure if I caught it on the camera but the whole thing would bulge up and make this really big scary looking bubble in the panel but um, that bubble basically while it's hot hit it with uh, the hammer and basically try and knock that dent in so what it's doing is I'm I'm squishing the metal back into itself again and making it uh, smaller. So when it when it cools and it goes back to normal, it's it starts trying to pull itself again and pulls itself tighter. And that at least is what I, I believe is happening. And um, it seems to have worked. As I said, there's no more uh, oil can effect, and this is all looking quite nice and neat now. So um, I think that's the um, the bulk of the bonnet done. I'm happy with the progress on the bonnet, so let's get back into this engine. I think it's time to start working on getting this head off. The first step is basically to remove this uh, cam gear and remove the chain because that's obviously tying the uh, the head to the uh, the bottom of the block. Before you remove that, take the tension out. They uh, the book gave me directions to make this little piece of timber, um, and basically what you do is you slide it down here between the two lengths of the chain. When you take the tension off, it stops the tension uh, from letting go and letting all its tension out, and uh, you've got to pull the whole thing apart to reset the tensioner and everything. So, this is the uh, the plan, and apparently you put a yeah a hook on it and some string so you can pull it back out again, and also it reminds you it's in there. All right, with the cam gear off and those two small little bolts that are uh, holding the head down at the front. It's time to actually start removing the head studs. I have to go through and remove them in the reverse order to the tensioning order. Okay, let's have a look and see what we have. There's no obvious impact spots on the top of the pistons where the valves have come into contact with the pistons, so that's a good thing. And then over here on the, um, on the head itself, you can see there's um, Looks like a lot of old dried uh, coolant sort of mess in the uh, in the water galleries. The head gaskets all appears to be intact. I can't see any obvious blowout. Further investigation to follow, I suppose.
For now, I think that's where I'm going to uh, have to leave it, so I think it must mean it's time for Fun Facts with Mrs. Jeff. Hi guys. After World War II, Nissan didn't begin car production again until 1947. Nissan chose to keep using the Datsun name for its cars, so the world market would not associate them with the Nissan trucks used during the war. They still used the Nissan name on their trucks and some high-end cars, however, such as the Cedric and the Nissan Patrol. Datsun by Nissan badges started appearing on their cars by the late 70s, and by September of 1981, they officially decided to consolidate their brand to Nissan. The rebranding campaign cost around 500 million US dollars and took place over several years. By the late 80s, the Datsun name was phased out completely. All right guys, that's it for another week. Um, this week, okay, I pulled the engine apart. Uh, a few of the issues I'm thinking now actually, uh, obviously none of the valves have touched the head, but maybe because the valves are sort of getting older and corroded, they're just not sealing very well, so I'm not getting a good enough seal to get compression. Um, definitely something I'm going to have to look into. Any suggestions of why it's uh, not working, please let me know. Um, quite happy with how the bonnets come out, so the uh, the panel work is moving forward, so um, hopefully I can keep moving forward on the engine and on the panel work and uh, we'll uh, get the whole thing finished together, unlike something else I know of. So um, if you want to help the channel out, please uh, go down to the description and uh, visit our store and you can get some of the, uh, the new Datsun shirts. And as always, um, if you're enjoying the videos, please like and subscribe to my channel, Home Built by Jeff, and you can follow me on Facebook and Instagram at the same place. See you guys. So the world market would not associate it with the Dissan. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I can be fishy as I'd consolidate the brand to Nissan. 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 Officially consolidate their name to become Datsun. I know what you're saying. <laughs> 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 so hard, isn't it? <laughs> you're so close.